Welcome back to the Lincolnshire Freemason podcast show with your presenters today, the amazing Simon Noden and myself, Chris Watkins. Unfortunately, Pete Richardson couldn't be here today because he is big in the game when it comes to brass instruments. And I think he is blowing his own trumpet today. Uh, isn't that right, Simon? I think he's... I don't, uh, I don't think he'll make a song and dance out of it, though. No, I tell you what, he's he's absolutely fantastic. Bloke, he comes from Kroll in uh, north northwest Link, northwest Lincolnshire, and what he doesn't know about woodwind, uh, sorry, brass instru- instruments is not worth knowing. Simon, yeah. he doesn't blow his own trumpet, but I think he is tonight. He's, he's um, a very talented guy, exceptional. I think he's big in the game on the ship in all you know the big cruise ships. Yeah. I know you, I like to say it, Mrs. Noden away for for a, a bit of R and R, and he his his skills might be teaching that brass band when you are serenading your gorgeous, lovely lady when you are going around the med on those lovely ships. <laughs> anyway, we have been, we have not come here for a laugh and a joke about uh, brass swing, brass instruments. We're here today, boys and girls, uh, to talk about the um, those of you who are Freemasons. Um, when you join Freemasonry, you have a a, a light blue coloured um, it's called a badge. Uh, they look like pities, but they're not. They're, they're to protect your, your what's names. Um, and when you've gone through the chair, you get a dark blue one, don't you, Simon? You do eventually. You do eventually. If you get provincial, is it provincial honours? Is that right? Yes, I think that's the right term. Okay. So once you've been through the chair, you still keep the light blue one. But when you get provincial honours, which is like a, 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 a badge of approval, you get a dark blue one. But they see some guys, Simon, that are going around the province in this gorgeous red crimson look. Mm. And some of us look at them and Simon say, you know, that is a beautiful colour. They do, do stand know? out. They, they do, do stand, stand out. out. They do. Um, so we have listened to the, the Lincolnshire Freemason fraternity and others from around the world. And I don't know if you know, Simon, we do actually get from uh, viewers and listeners from all over the world, over the four corners of the globe. Mm. Um, and some people said, what are, what are these guys that wear the red pinnies and the red aprons what are they all about they, they walk around look like they own the place they seem to know what they're talking about so what are those red things and and some what are those those what is all the red for what what are they are they special people they are there's a very distinct uh you know from what they got i'm sure the guys will tell you it's uh it's a bit of a privilege for the guys who wear that apron but we'll let them tell us because it's their okay. story so, so today we're here to talk about a provincial stewards lodge, okay, uh, or provincial grand stewards lodge. Is that what's what's the what's the correct phrase, um, uh, Simon? Uh, I believe it's a uh, Lincolnshire provincial grand stewards lodge. Is it? Have I got that right? Well, I'll tell you what. I'll tell you what we'll do, Simon. Is this? Uh, we've got the wonderful David, Nathan, Shailen, and Neil today. So I tell you what I'd like to do is this off the cuff because you know we like to shoot from the hip. Why don't you ask these guys? Why don't we start off them easy and just you? Why don't you just ask some questions about what the provincial grand stewards lodge is, and then individually we'll take we'll we'll take one one on one and real drill down and find out why these guys love Freemasonry and why they love the grand stewards lodge. Go for it, Simon. And give everybody an insight into their wonderful world. So Nathan, can I ask you first? So, what does it mean to be a provincial grand steward, and, and what is the role within Freemasonry? Uh, so as a provincial grand steward, we, we were all active last year, made active last year. So we were part of the team, um, which has now meant that we've joined the provincial grand stewards lodge. Now, as part of the provincial grand stewards lodge, which we've only just joined. So we've, we've only been members for about a month. Um, we've already had an email uh, with a load of dates, which gives us the opportunity to carry on visiting and going out. Um, because we take the wardens out when there's events on during uh, the province throughout the province they also use the stewards so so we get asked whether we want to help and and all that sort of thing so so really the, the stewards in the province are there for helping around the province for everything that needs doing and also attending on the wardens for their visits during their active year they're very they're very busy guys aren't they constantly in the background so uh next neil can i ask you uh can you explain the process of joining the provincial grand stewards lodge 
And what are the uh, you know the requirements for that membership? What do you need? So um, to be um, asked or invited to join the provincial Grand Stewards Lodge, you've got to be a provincial steward at some point. So to Nathan's point, um, last year we were all active stewards. Mm -hmm. So naturally then we've got that opportunity then to, to join uh, mm -hmm. that provincial Grand Stewards Lodge. And as Nathan says, just sort of carry on some of those duties that we've done over the year and enjoyed sort of so much, you know, whilst part of the active provincial team. So you guys were sort of class of 2022. Is that what it was? You're all in the, the same cohort, shall we say? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, uh, and is it necessary to have been a worshipful master in order to, to be a member of the Provincial Grand Stewards Lodge? David, I was going to ask Shailen, but he's done a runner. <laughs> you've obviously, you've obviously <laughs> written away there, Simon. <laughs> No, Simon, that's a good question. And yes, um, being in uh, getting any provincial rank is, is something that happens after you're a worshipful master. Um, so the idea is that you've reached the highest position in your own lodge. You've um, taken care of that capably. You've been um, uh, a good member of the lodge. And a couple of years after that, then I think you get invited to be a provincial officer after that. So you, you sort of get the letter. But it is um, not um, an inevitable thing by any means. I think there's there's uh, people sort of almost like watch you and see how you've done and then consider whether if you're invited to do it, whether you do it well, whether you've got the time, because not everyone's got the time to commit to these sort of things. So I think people assumed rightly that we could um, devote evenings and weekends to all of this, but also that we'd um, do the province proud. In other words, that we could sort of go around the province and do visits um, and that we could show Freemasonry in a good light. So hopefully we've done that so far. I went to Ropsley at weekend with my wife. And I were explaining to her the, the role of shoes when you sort of, you know, we were met at the entrance by Gideon and Andy Ham, etc., who who've been stewards in the previous years. And, mm -hmm. you know, the guys never stop working, do they? They just, you know, we turn up with our wives and families, but we're here for a great time. And you guys are like, it's all right, we're working. Anyway, Nathan, I was going to ask Shailen a question, but he's, a, <laughs> he's disappeared. So, Nathan, why do you wear red? Um... That is a good question, and to the answer, I I can't tell you. I'm not entirely sure myself. So that is something that I need to find out and look into, and and find out why we do wear red. So, so someone needs to go to Solomon, down. don't they? Someone needs to go to Solomon now and find out. So we can put that live. <laughs> so it, it's nothing to do with red wine that's been spilt. On. <laughs> Let's cover it up. <laughs> right. So, uh, oh, Neil, no, Shayla's still not back. <laughs> uh, right. We've never, had anybody, we've never had anybody lose anyone before, have we, Chris? Yeah, we're only on number three, and we pro <laughs> we've promised the provincial ground. I'm down already. We'll get to 21. I don't know if you know, yeah. uh, chaps, but if you get to 21, you're in the top 1% of all world podcasts. Yeah. So that's yeah, what we promised. You might pop back on for number 21. Uh, right. <laughs> so, Neil, it's you, because... Shailen's not here. We just wait till he comes and we're just answering three, four questions in one go. Then, uh, so what? Are, what are some of the benefits and opportunities available to the members of the provincial Grand Stewards Lodge, both personal development and your Masonic development? So, I mean, personally, um, I mean, it's just you know, once you join sort of masonry, one of the first jobs you get is a steward. So, um, that for me was that opportunity to 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 help people within your lodge and. You know, you, you quite often go behind the bar, serve at the meals and stuff like that. So once you get to that point where you then become a provincial steward, the theory is kind of the same. You then get to help the rest of the your Masonic fraternity. So to Nathan's point, you know, if we have any kind of uh, social events, then we've got the opportunity to go and assist and help within that as well. Um, there's also the, the provincial uh, meetings where you can assist and help with those as well. You know, whether or not you're guiding people um up for their honors and stuff like that so it it's that ability to be able to assist and help and continue that i think it's a busy role isn't it it is very, neil, uh, simon do you mind if, do you mind if just do a very quick follow-up with neil and um, there's not many provincial roles where basically you get it for a year and then you've almost got it for life that's almost what you're saying isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. it is and, and if i'm honest i think steward was probably one of my favorite roles originally once that you know I joined masonry and it, it was the only opportunity to be able to meet everybody and introduce yourself to everybody and, and get to know everybody and every lodge sort of does that and then to carry that on now and to be able to do that within the province is you know it's 
it's unbelievable, really. Yeah, it's, it is an honour. Your guys say when you talk to you is a uh, once a steward, always a steward. Yeah. And again, you know, everyone's you know, to get to your life, everyone's been a worshipful master, but you move on from that, don't you? But you were always a steward, no matter what role you go on to. Now you were always a steward. Continues, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, David, in the absence of Shailen again, <laughs> he probably run off to help somebody in his capacity as a steward. It probably <laughs> has, yeah. Uh, it's perhaps he's going to get his apron, I don't know. Uh, so, how does a provincial ground steward lodge support and collaborate other other lodges and Masonic bodies within the province? Are there specific projects or in initiates or that members participate and contribute to the broader <laughs> community? I think the main one is the um, uh, stewarding of the provincial ground lodge, which of course is like an annual event uh, which handles all aspects of what the provincial ground lodge does, uh, mainly investing the officers accepting guests from around the country because it's um there's, there's a lot of the provincial grandmasters and other dignitaries that turn up and it's, it's a really big event um, in the center of Lincolnshire and and to do that requires a lot of a lot of manpower really so I think that's the main the main thing that we help out with with every year so from now on we'll be sort of um every every sort of aspect of it whether it's welcoming dignitaries um car parking um you know that, letting people find out where the toilets are that sort of thing um, but it's about making sure people are welcome and they know what they're doing. So that, they're the main things. And then there's various charity events throughout the year. But I think um, when people want to um, put on an event, they'll see what the stewards think and see who's available and stuff. So it's almost as if we enable things to happen yeah. by being ready and by being sort of um, keen to help. You're a bit like the Thunderbirds of Provincial Lodge, are you? Is that, is that, yeah. Oh, like international, Power Rangers, rescue, right? international stewards, yeah. international rescue or something. Do you, do you ever get time to sit down at Provincial Grand Lodge? Because when I've been, you just, you just everywhere you guys, just a little flashes of red flying around here, there, and everywhere. So do you actually get to sit down at some point there? Whilst you eat. Yeah. <laughs> true. True. Absolutely. Uh, we've got a new guest joining us now. Welcome, Shane. Oh, ah, welcome back. <laughs> I mean, <it's... laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm at work, so that's why. Hence the blue uniform. Don't worry. So at times I'm having to be called. We thought you'd gone to get your apron, Shale, and you've got to come full <laughs> kit. <laughs> oh, no, 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 no. No, the apron is kept very safely in a, in, right. in a case. So you're just in time for your question as well, Shale. Uh -huh. Just in time for your question. So, Shale, are there any particular roles or responsibilities within the Provincial Grand Stewards Lodge that members can aspire to? And how do these roles contribute and the functions of the lodge? Um, yeah. There are different roles, obviously, um, and I find for myself the the main thing that I've done of late as a steward is trying to be as creative as I can on my feet, come mm. up with ideas, mm. and present those ideas to uh, the stewards lodge, which uh, we were going to do not so long ago, but unfortunately one thing led to another. We haven't done that, uh, but not, nonetheless, that's still in the pipeline, which we will be doing shortly. Uh, I think Neil would uh, support me with that. We were looking at uh, supporting the festival in terms of um, uh, having a car wash. That is so, something that... Yeah. Yeah. So when, you, when you're in your Grand Stewards Lodge, you guys, so uh -huh. that's it, you've been Worshipful Master, you've got your provincial honours, you've got your, your red apron. So is it like an, another lodge, you know, like where you can go, well, I can go my junior warden, I can go and be senior deacon, and uh, I can go through the chair again. I can be a Worshipful Master of that lodge now but to be honest with you i am not sure how it actually works yeah. um we've only joined sort of last month right. so so we haven't really sort of uh you know but do, uh, in your in your lodge do you have do you have the roles that are similar to the other lodges that the guys work up from junior warden wishful master you know them sort of roles like um yes yeah. they do yeah yes absolutely yes, there are. yeah so it operates like in effect the man you know, it works like a the normal lodge that we all see, all the guys see. We were actually discussing this um, last month once we all joined, um, weren't we, Nathan, that the, mm. there would be that natural progression if you'd, you'd join the lodge where you would join what we call the ladder and you worked your mm. way up. But because that many mm. of us joined in one go, and then each year there's that many of them that join, and there's quite a lot within the lodge, we predict that, you know, it may be, quite a lot of years before you then have that opportunity but then not everybody would want to to be able to do that as well so how many, how many get selected to be a steward each year when you know you all go and you all meet your cohort how many is there in, in sort of your your year eight 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 yeah 
And there's Previous always... years, I think it's been six, yeah. but they, they've been they've enhanced it to eight, and I think this year it was eight again. Right. But, so, but they didn't they didn't all join the stewards' lodge. There, there were only six of us, I think, that did join the stewards' lodge. Yeah. So, and again, at some point, we may see you guys as wishful master of that stewards' lodge. <laughs> I think it'd be a while. It's it's quite a humbling thing to join the Grand Stewards Lodge because you get you become a grand you know a provincial Grand Lodge officer. You know yeah. you get your, your big apron and stuff. You go through all the investment and have a great year, and then you join a lodge in which everyone else, by definition, is a provincial Grand Lodge officer. So mm -hmm. it's very humbling. It's as if you're starting your Masonic journey again. You go and sit at the back. You learn. You listen. You make friends and things like that. So it's quite a nice thing to to uh, to do. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you for that, gentlemen. We've, we've passed the first part. Let's move on to the second part. And we're going to drill down individually uh, of what you love about Freemasonry. Um, and uh, I'm going to start off with Nathan, if, if that's OK with you, Nathan. And uh, I just I'm going to ask you a few questions. Let's keep them short and sharp, because, as I said, we don't want uh, people listening to this and we don't want to waste their not waste their time, but we don't want to go on too long. But. Uh, the first question is, what initially drew you to Freemasonry and why did you join? Um, my, my initial reason for joining was that the chap that I work with, he was a member and had been going for a few years and just spoke to me about it. Uh, originally, when he asked me about joining, I, I sort of give it a miss and, and didn't bother. But then after, after a few years, I thought, well, yeah, I'll, I'll give it a whirl and, and we'll see what it's about and, and joined eventually. In 2010, I think it was. 2010. You must have been a child when you joined. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so how has the rich history of Freemasonry influenced your passion for being in a, a Freemason? I, I only caught part of that, that question. Okay. It how, keeps okay. up and with low. Um, Don't worry. But, but, so, yeah, his, okay, his, let me answer it again. What's, how has the rich history of Freemasonry influenced your passion for Freemasonry? Um, yeah, it has influenced my passion for it, especially when I'm learning the ritual. You you learn certain bits of ritual, and and you sort of take it in better as you learn it. And and yeah, it, it does. It definitely makes you think more about the history side of it and where it all originated from and where where it came from. So yeah, it's it's great. Good stuff. And and can you think of a particular moment or event within Freemasonry that truly exemplified the power of and and again we had a chat just before you switched the camera on that you said the camaraderie and friendship of Freemasonry how you know how did how did that impact on your perception of the organization and that and the camaraderie well I, I was I ended up I'm now a member of Baines Lodge in, in Market Raisin and I was a joining member I didn't start there originally but as, as a joining member I'd certainly, you know, fitted in really well. And all the members down there were great and welcomed me. So, so yeah, it's, it's excellent. And, and I even socially now, I still see some of the members socially, not, not just as a, at Lodge, but, but out of Lodge as well. OK, I mean, I, I talk to an awful lot of Freemasons and they say for the first few years, it kind of, it's all going over their head. They, they don't know what the hell's happening and they have wobbles saying, is this for me? When did the penny drop for you where it went, ah, um yeah i think it yeah for for a couple of years it certainly is sort of where you you sit back and take it in i think once you do that first bit of ritual or you, or you start reading a bit i mean so so it was once once i'd been made a master mason I, I was a master mason within a year i think um when i originally joined but then once i learned my first bit of ritual it's it's sort of you start to take it in better when you read it and learn it and and you you performing it i mean what would your message be to people who are in that first couple of years and it's all a bit oh this is a bit strange what would your message be to those people my message to them would be just just if you haven't done any bit of floor work yet just just have a go at something pick pick something you like the sound of so any bit of ritual you've heard just just start reading it and, and give it a go and learn it. And, and it sort of sinks in better as, as you start to learn it and read it. Now, interestingly, you talk about the rituals and and uh, and from that, the symbols and the historical aspect of Freemasonry. Um, how has that enhanced your personal connection to the principles of and teachings of Freemasonry by learning the rituals? Um, 
by learning it, you sort of, I don't know, that's a difficult one, I think, but you sort of take take it on board. And, you know, as as it's the, the like the, in the first degree, we, we do the northeast corner, it's a piece of work I've done. And, and it's quite a bit about charity and all that sort of thing, which, which, you know, is a good principle of Freemasonry. And it just, it does help when you're reading it and learning it and taking it on board. I think that's a big one, isn't it? Is that we can learn it by rote, but actually reading it and understanding it. And I must admit, the northeast corner is one of my favourite pieces of 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 this ceremony. So much so that my Twitter name is Northeast Corner Chris because I'm so famous <laughs> at it, famously bad at it. But but uh, we, won't, we won't dwell on that one. Um, a final question is: um, How's Freemasonry positively impacted? on your personal relationships outside the club? How's it made you a better man? Um, just just in general, the way the way you are with, with people, I think, and just, just you know, it, it's general teachings of, of putting other things first and all that sort of thing. Good stuff. Uh, so, thank you for thank you for that. That's been really good, Nathan. Um, Simon, no over to you. I don't know which next victim oh. you're going to call next. <laughs> Nathan mentioned is a member of Bayern's Lodge, and I believe they're having an open day. If any of our visitors want, our viewers want to go and see Nathan in person. Good stuff, Nathan. Yes. When's that? When's that? It, it's happening on the eighth of July. We've got an open day, and it will be from ten o'clock till two o'clock. I shall be there. I'll be uh, green. I expect so. You're a steward. You'll be having a yellow penny and everything. <laughs> Parking car. Red. Yeah, but yeah, I shall. I shall have the red apron on. I should think while I'm there. And if, if anybody wants a selfie with you after seeing you on here, <laughs> um, <laughs> they'll have to see. Good stuff. Good stuff. I must admit, I've never been to to Market Race, and it is quite a distance from the south of the county, but it is a beautiful, beautiful town. Um, right, uh, Simon, what's your next? I've, got, I've got Neil, and I believe Neil, your dad's a Freemason as well, is he? He is, yeah, and, and that's sort of where my journey started, really. It was, yeah. I, I joined when, as an opportunity to spend that bit more time, really, with my dad and give us a sort of a, a common interest. We both live in different towns, and it was, it just seemed a logical thing. He'd, he'd become a member and been for a few years and said that, you know, he thought I would enjoy it and enjoy the people and enjoy what we do, and, and he was absolutely right. So I'm what the class is a Lewis. Mm. Yes, and my son is as well, so I'm the... So a Lewis, a Lewis is a yeah. son of a Freemason coming in yeah. to Freemasonry. Yeah. So that's, the, that's the magic thing about Freemasonry. Everyone has a, ne a name or an analogy of something else, isn't it? And it kind of a lot of people go, well, why do you say that? Well, it's all about analogy and, 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 and other things. And I think a Lewis is like a supporting bolt... I was told once by somebody. So that's where the name comes from as a Lewis, and it's that supporting bolt to obviously your father, I suppose. So yeah. it's quite a nice, nice thing. It's quite a pleasure, really, quite a privilege to be. And are there any specific moments or memories you want to share with us, like your know, dad and lad moment, moment, you know, Freemasonry? Um, <laughs> well, there's probably quite a few to be fair. So well, obviously, there's um, quite an age gap between myself and my father. and my memory is probably a little bit better than his. And, uh, you know, a prime example would be over the last couple of years, he's been the secretary of our lodge and I've been the assistant secretary. Um, and he has, let's say, leaned on me a little bit for a few prompts and uh, a few sort of directions as to where he needs to go. So I think uh, it's always nice to see and, and nice to be able to support him like that. But uh, there have been a few moments where he's, he's chucked out the wrong word and, you give him a little prompt and he still chucks out the wrong word as well. So it must, it, if you might, I'm just jumping in here, Neil, it must be really nice to, you know, when we get older, we don't actually do that much with our parents and just to, to feel part of that, you know, that must be really good. It is. Yeah. I mean, you know, to be able to, to see him that much and, you know, we're members of a, a lodge that's in London as well. So we also travel down to London. Uh, is that a Saturday one? Yeah. It is, yes. Ah, oh, we all know why you go down on a Saturday, so you can have a few uh, shandy pops. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Simon. I, I put it, I, I've never known a Freemason who drinks, so I don't understand it. Um, <laughs> and as you mentioned, being a Freemason has, has, has changed you as a man. Uh, could you elaborate on the personal growth or transformation you've experienced and how it's influenced your perspective on life and relationships? Yeah, I think, you know, 
sort of work wise as well i think it's affected me you know when you become a freemason and, and as nathan says you, you start to look at some of the ritual and you start to learn bits and want to do bits you've got to then organize your time you know to be able to, to, to factor that in and i think it's helped me sort of organize uh, the way i approach things a lot better and you know, that's definitely helped within my work life uh, personally um it's just that ability to be able to enjoy yourself enjoy what you do but then you know see the help that you give and the difference that it makes to each other and you know as a an active team last year we you know all of us here have only known each other for a year but it does feel like a lifetime to be honest already so i think that's where it you know it affects you most there's a definite bond that, between you all absolutely and i could see that when i, I uh, shaylin invited me as a guest to your lodge and i could see that bond when i watched you together now you sat at the festive board together and it was lovely to see as somebody looking in it was you know you could see that there's that you know there's definite attachment between you all so which brings us to helping others so it seems to be an important aspect of freemasonry can you share any particular moment or instance that you felt a deep fulfillment by assisting somebody in need and how freemasonry has helped you to make a positive impact on somebody else's life yeah, I think a perfect example would probably be when I was master, um, the, the money that we raised throughout that year as master, we, we donated to a, um, how would I describe it? It's a charity that helps um, ex-servicemen look for work and get back into work and get back into sort of society. And it wasn't a huge amount of money, you know, in a, a grand scheme of things, you know, but I took a check to them for £500 and they taught me through what that 500 pound and it would do and it basically kept them going for a whole year um it would buy tea and biscuits and that when the the servicemen would come and they'd be able to you know spend that time and that then they could help them with you know looking for jobs and help them with cvs and stuff like that and i think just lots of little small amounts like that can make a huge difference to people you know and what it can do and you know to know that that kept that organization going for a whole year is you know, it's absolutely unbelievable to be fair which brings us nicely to our next question so freemasonry it places value on both time and monetary contributions to the masonic hall how do you personally balance your commitments to freemasonry with the aspects of your life and how does the principle of giving and what you can afford resonate with you it's it's about um I mean, within Freemason, there's absolutely no pressure to give financially or time um, yeah. a specific amount or a specific, specific sort of focus. It's you give what you can, time financially as well, and, and every bit is appreciated and every bit is well received. And I, I think as a Mason, that's, that's one thing that resonates with me more than anything is that everybody is different, but everybody is treated the same, if that makes sense. Yeah, they were all unique. Right, and engaging in engaging activities you enjoy while helping others can be incredibly rewarding. We'll all agree with that. Can you give an example of a specific activity or project within Freemasonry that's allowed you to combine combine your interests and your passions with an opportunity to make a difference to the community? Um, that's a, ooh, that's a good one. That mm. just in general, really, any. Any kind of activity we do, we you know within the lodge, if you do a raffle, um, to be able to go around and, and interact with the members and you know a bit of a bit of fun while you're doing it and it just Did you, it adds to it if that makes sense. Yeah, you might get the odd one that throw it in on a night, might you saying, Can we give some money from the raffle to this particular call? Yeah. You have a whip round then and the, the community's sort of benefited it, yeah. instantly that night, haven't they? Uh and Sort of at the end, I mean, you know, Nathan's already plugged his lodge. Have you got anything coming up in yours? Uh, nothing in a lodge for established order. We have, um, uh, in my London lodge, we've actually got um, another lodge that have announced that they want to uh, to visit uh, and they're bringing 60 members. Yeah. Is uh, quite a quite, and... there's, there's a lot of rich history behind the lodge. It's originally um, formed in India and comes from Calcutta, so it has Nigerian workings. And it seems to be of interest to this uh, lodge, which is Portsmouth's way over, I think it is. And they've announced that they want to come and visit. So in November, we've got 
uh, 60 visitors, which um, bearing in mind that the lodge only has about 22 members currently, it's uh, it's going to be quite an interesting day, I think, to be fair. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, <laughs> we've disappeared again. Well, I'll tell you what, um, why don't I do David and then hopefully Shailen will come back and then you can finish off with Shailen. How does that sound? If, if, he's, if he's here long enough, if not, we'll just give these well, guys. Okay, okay, good stuff. Right, okay. <laughs> right, so uh, David, thanks for joining us today. Um, uh, interestingly, we were talking about ex-servicemen and I believe you're an ex-soldier. Um, you, when we had before we switched the cameras on, you were talking about that you like the the experience of a strong sense of camaraderie within your unit. How does the camaraderie of Freemasonry compare to your military experience, and what resonates with you the most about it? I think it follows on really well. Um, my father was in the army, so as a, as a child, I travelled, and then I joined the army myself at fifteen and did a did a few years. So I'd always been out of the town. So one of the first things that Freemasonry did for me was like plug myself plug me back in with people locally actually sort of to get to know people again and get that connection and stuff um, but very quickly I found that um, some of the things that I really liked about the army um, things like ceremony things like making an effort in Freemasonry is this thing about labour and refreshment you work really hard together to produce something and then you have a damn good time afterwards you know and, and you know have, um, enjoy yourself and stuff so that, that's a very military thing um, dressing not dressing up as such but just dressing well um, looking after each other there's a little bit of hierarchy in Freemasonry, but it's taken uh, in, a, in a great spirit, which I think is really, really good, um, which, which, is, which is excellent. I think as an ex-military person, you sort of gel with that quite quickly. You know, you can do your salutes and stuff. You can take salutes from other people, but it doesn't change who you are as a person, which I think is sort of really valuable. And I've really enjoyed uh, the festive board, which is like the Masonic dinner. Um, you sit down at a festive board and you sit down with anybody, really, um, people in the 70s, 80s and 90s, who've had these fantastic lives and stuff. And the things you can sort of talk about uh, at festive boards are absolutely fantastic. And it's that sort of fraternal sharing of uh, like men's experience, uh, which is which is really powerful. And that's really helped me stick with it over the years. Interestingly, you you mentioned that, you know, Freemasonry had both younger generation, you know, like you babies on this call now, but there's the older generation. What is the importance of reconnecting with the older generation, Freemasons, you know, why is that important to you and how does this connection hold so, so obviously you've mentioned it, such significance to you personally? Well, firstly, I love being called a baby when I've got a white beard and stuff. It's just wonderful. Helps my midlife crisis no end. But no, you're absolutely right. Um, when, when you sit down to people with people in the 70s, 80s and 90s and stuff, you just realise um, that there's not much they don't know, that they can have a real sort of moderating voice. Um, if you explain your troubles, they can sort of see where, how say how they went through them. If you're taking the wrong attitude towards something, they can just very gently, you know, just sort of point you in the right way and say, have you considered it from this way? Um, and they, you know, they can they can just sort of um, have almost like that sort of worldly wise approach to things, which is really, really good as you're finding your way. I think sometimes it's quite easy to get anxious because you're not sure what you're doing is right in general. I mean, outside of the lodge. But I think, you know, having access to these guys is, is really, really great. And I, I look forward to sort of, you know, eating and drinking with them, find out what they've been up to. Interestingly, you said about 30 seconds ago that Freemasonry has a hierarchical structure with various different levels and degrees. How has the hierarchical nature of Freemasonry influenced your decision? Um, not necessarily, so not, not decision, in your ability as a manager, yourself in your daytime role uh, and leadership skills. And how's it contributed to you being a better bloke and a better boss? I think I was a few years in once I'd, uh, I started doing some ritual and then started to do various offices. You do more ritual and you help other people around the lodge as you go uh, get deeper into Freemasonry. And after a while, I sort of almost figured out it's a bit like a leadership school in the sense that um, more is expected of you year on year. It's nicely scaffolding. scaffolding. But after about 10, 12 years, you find yourself in the master's chair and there's a, there's a point where you uh, uh, bang the gavel and everybody does what you say, which I think for a lot of people is the first time that's ever happened. And I think that that's a real step change in how you see yourself, not in like a sort of megalomaniac type of way, but just, you know, if you decide something, people will back you up. If you um, take a risk, people will support you. Everyone wants you to succeed. And I think after those sort of years, being in the chair and just afterwards, back at work and stuff, I'm much more confident in um, leading, in suggesting things and putting myself out there. And I'm grateful to Freemason for, for that chance. What's been your favourite role within your craft lodge and why? 
Wow, that's an excellent question. I really enjoyed being in the chair, even though it terrified me for the whole time I was I was doing it for all those reasons that people actually did what I say, which is quite kind of terrifying. Um, but after that, when you when you're what's called like a pass master, those sort of couple of years after that, you sort of join this almost like gang of people at the back who sort of know what they're talking about and interject and help people and stuff. And I think it was in a couple of years after that where um you call from the back benches to do a bit of ritual or help with the candidate and stuff. That that's been really sort of satisfying because you sort of um people assume that you're wise. Um so it's almost like you sort of grow into well, you've got the you've got the white beard for it, mate. So you've got yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um you said also on camera that allegories play a significant role in your perception of Freemasonry. Could you tell the viewers and the listeners what do you mean by that? I think this is probably from my um, last few years as an English teacher. So I teach poetry and plays and stuff. So, you know, a flower is not just a flower, but it, it means this and so on. Freemasonry, Freemasonry is really stacked with that uh, from like the square and compasses. As you go through masonry, they, they you're taught like to speculate on their meanings and given hints as to what they are. But they're generally to do with morality, uh, to, do, to do with um, how you relate to other people. And as you go on to sort of deeper subjects as well about your life on earth, really. But it's never it's not dogmatic. I think what allegory, you know, uh, uh, gives you is an is a chance to make up your own mind, really, and not have to sort of argue or, or come to a right answer, but just sort of fit it in with way, you know, with, with what you're doing. And because symbolism is everywhere in the lodge, you're always reminded of it. There's always like a square somewhere or a, a, com a compass or a plumb rule or something. So it really sort of builds up, I think. Well, let's uh, this just one final question. Someone watching this might not be a Freemason, so they might not want, know what an allegory is. So could you just explain what that is? Just, you know, because that's that's the purpose of this is to educate. Yes. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Um, it's a figure like a figure of speech. So we're not, not necessarily talking about literal things. Um, so whenever you sort of use a metaphor or when you're just talking about something else, then really it's for us to think about what that something else is. So um, there's a nice line in Freemasonry. We're taught we're not operative Masons. We don't actually build stone. We work with stone nowadays. What are we working with? So that's like that's an allegory. The answer to that is it comes to you after a few years in Freemasonry when you actually start to figure out what it is you're doing. Good stuff. Good stuff. Now it looks like Shailen has had to leave us. I believe he's in the medical profession, so it's probably been called out for for an emergency. So let's let us hope that everything is okay on that one. I'm sure we can catch up with him another time. Um, Simon, just any final this, questions? Just curious, we know we know what. Lodges Neil and Nathan's from. So, Dave, can you remind us what your mother lodge is? Oh, it's uh, Astral in Grimsby, uh, aka uh, Happy Astral Lodge. Um, so ahead. we're uh, um, consecrated about 1918. So we're just not long after our centenary, um, and it's a lodge that was uh, made up of ex Air Forcemen um, and soldiers and stuff. So we've always had a high quotient of ex military people in it. So good Go stuff. Good. Yeah, well, nice vibe. Got a feeling I might be coming visiting you on the. 15th of September. <laughs> oh, please do. Excellent. I Excellent. We're, we're out the other night, uh, and I think we've blagged a visit off one of your members. <laughs> Excellent. As you do, as you do when you're free, mate. Really. It's uh, everyone's always inviting everyone somewhere. Absolutely. Be good to see you. Well, yeah. boys and girls, I, I think we'll we'll leave it at that. So it's my understanding is this: if you can to become a member of the provincial Grand Stewards Lodge, you have to have been a provincial steward. Uh, which is considered an honour, you are then able, if you want to, only if you want to, join the lodge itself, and then you'll become a lodge, uh, a provincial grand lodge, almost, you can constantly wear the red all the time if, if you want to, is that correct? Mm. Correct, yeah. Okay. There is onerous things that you're expected to do, stuff like car parking and tickets at, at big events, but also the fact is, is that you are considered masons who go above and beyond so it's kind of give and take and um, i've learned an awful lot today um i don't know about you simon have you learned anything this i've learned lots and lots yeah because i were always I were, I were always curious like you say you see the guys come in lodge and you go why is the red from red why are they different yeah. and it's answered a lot of uh today's answered a lot of my questions so i think boys and girls watching this obviously it's all boys so it's just i use that phrase boys and girls <laughs> in my in my podcasting is is if you do see a Freemason with a red penny, apron, badge, I'll get told off by the powers that be on that one, but there'll, there'll always be pennies to me. Uh, blame my mother. Um, go up, 
and talk to them and find out what makes them tick because I think you'll find that they are the cream of the cream in Freemasonry. That no, we are all equal. Mm. It's just that some are more equal than others. So to get given that job, that role is an honor. So if you're ever asked, do take it on board this. I think by the sounds of it, for your whole year, you're out quite a lot. And afterwards you're probably going to be. So you're gonna have to be able to give that time away, you know. You know, we're not talking about every night here or two nights a week here, are we? What you took what what at what commitment in the actual year itself? How many nights were you out over and above that you wouldn't have been if you weren't a provincial steward? About uh, twenty, I think, wasn't it, Nathan? Would you say yeah, it, was, it was around twenty? I think I think yeah. I did during the active year. So that's twenty. So that's twenty over eight or nine months. So probably we're talking two two and a half extra evenings. A, week, a month which on the whole scheme of things is not huge is it Simon? No no and it's if you enjoy it it's well worth doing. Well thank I, you. I, I, if, 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 if any of the viewers are out and they see the stewards uh, and they, they are at an event and it's a hot day like I said take time to go and have a speak to them offer to buy them a drink they might be stood there waiting and just think I wish somebody would bring me a drink it's hot. And so you get so you're looking for the lads in the in the yellow jackets. Do, do they have the provincial grand steward on the back? They do. There's a badge on the back. There's big letters on the back of it. Take okay. them a drink. I'm sure they'll appreciate it. And they or if they're it. in lodge, they've got the red the red aprons. There yeah, you go. I'm a drink, I'm a drink in lodge as well. Oh. In, well, there you go, Boy Scouts. So just raise a glass when you when people are buying you beers. Think of Simon and myself. Um, thank you for your time today, gentlemen. It's a shame that Shane had to go, but I'm sure we'll catch up another time. David, Nathan and Neil, thank you very much for your time and efforts. Uh, big shout thank out you. to co-presenter Pete, who couldn't be here today. Uh, we're missing you, man. And we look forward to seeing you back on episode number four. Simon, thank you for your thank efforts. You guys. And um, we'll see you next time on episode four of the Lincolnshire Freemason podcast show. So well, let's go wave goodbye and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Smile and wave, boys. Ha <laughs> ha, <laughs> cheers.